good afternoon and welcome to folks here and to folks joining us online. One way I might introduce Usman Power Green is to tell you that he's an associate professor in the Department of History at Clark University. To tell you that there, he specializes in African-American social and political movements, or to tell you that he's the author of Against Wind and Tide, the African-American struggle against the colonization movement, which came out in 2014, a book which examines Black Americans' efforts to agitate for equal rights in the North and Midwest in the face of the American Colonization Society's colonization movement. I could tell you, too, that he's a historian of the Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro Movement, and probably that he's one of the most severe thinkers about Hubert Harrison, a leader for Harlem political and social radicalism at the turn of the 20th century. Or I might tell you that Usman Power Green is also a novelist. In particular, he's the author of the just out book, The Confessions of Matthew Strong, an exciting offering into the long history of white supremacist organizations, their embeddedness in the fabric of American life, and of Black people's long and organized and everyday resistance to them. This book feels potent and timely. But I would be remiss if I didn't also say something like this. Usman Power Green loves to study and his belief in thinking, his belief in the possibility that reading and writing and arguing are vibrant practices of a civic and human life. His belief in thinking is inspiring to me. It is a belief that in its gloriousness is matched by his understanding that black people have long been stewards of studying that happens in formal, even elite institutions as it happens in homes or small business settings or church fronts. I can attest to his love of ideas because I spent years studying with Usman in Western Mass. He was then a near-term graduate student and I was a lecturer teaching at a local college. I saw his brilliance then, I saw his ferocity then, and I've never not been in awe of it. So, we are lucky today, since Professor Power Green will read from his book and then will join me for a conversation. We are lucky, yes, but I'm lucky too. I've been lucky all these years, Usman, to know you and to learn from you. So let's get started. Please help me to welcome Usman Power Green. Um, thank you to Kevin Kwashi, who is a singular individual uh, who years ago, I, you know, I was showing him my notebook from 2007. Um, I, I've known Professor Kwashi for longer than that, actually, um, but he's been a steady presence in my life as an intellectual and thinker um, and also a person who I could confide my secret love of, of writing fiction. Uh, you know, as some of us may know, you know, academic spaces and, and artistic spaces sometimes uh, people believe they don't jive so well. And so I was uh, not as forthcoming about my creative life with, with some of my colleagues in the way that I was with friends and, and colleagues who, who live closer to me. Um, and that's sort of how I wanna, wanna frame um, my talk uh, and, and think about and, and read, from the, read from the novel as well. Um, but I thought that I would also spend some time and in context to, to why this book, um, which, as I said, begin in a very different moment, right? Even though, as my publisher used to say, that's just like in your book, when, when various things would happen over the last couple of years. Um, and I'd be like, you know, for, for those of us that study black social political movements, um, you know, we're unfortunately never too surprised uh, when we see you know, actions, we see the resurgence of white supremacy, we see the resurgence in the, the reconfigurations of white power. You know, unfortunately, um, we have not come to a point yet uh, when, when that's changed. Um, and so we continue to, um, you know, to educate ourselves and come together and help people understand the type of poison uh, this ideology really is, right? Um, this is 
my author note. When Barack Obama won the 2008 presidential election, I recall watching on TV Barack and Michelle Obama hold their daughter's hands, waving to a crowd of over 200,000 people who gathered in Grant Park in Chicago and feeling a sense of dread that some racist would run up to the stage and assassinate him and the first black family. I know this is a dark thought, but often when I would tell someone this, they admit having the same fear. Although we were spared such a horrific spectacle, the morning after the election, a white man crept over to a newly constructed black church in Springfield, Massachusetts, about 20 miles from where I live, and poured gasoline all over the church and burned it down. The hatred that motivated this white man to burn down a church was the same hatred I feared would compel some racists to do the act I mentioned. As Dylan Roof's assassination of black state Senator Clementa Pickney in Charleston, South Carolina illustrates, black success represents to white supremacists an existential threat to their quote unquote way of life, to what defines them and provides them with a sense of respect and power in US society. However, the events in this novel testify to black people's willingness to do all in their power to stop those who would shoot the first black president, perhaps, burn down a black church, or kidnap black children to gratify their base desires. Although the main drama of, of this particular novel takes place in the South, specifically Alabama, uh, where my paternal grandmother was born, I agree with Malcolm X, who once pointed out, as long as you're south of Canada, you're in the South. The geography of hate in the United States is certainly not an exclusively Southern phenomenon. One need only consider the success of the Ku Klux Klan organizing in New York, Connecticut, and Michigan since the 1970s, or listen to the voices of New York State troopers shouting white power after invading Attica and murdering unarmed innocents for proof. More recently, consider the neo-Nazi from Ohio who weaponized his car and murdered Heather Heyer and injured other, over three dozen others during the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And like some sick racist ritual, another white supremacist, this one from Maine, reacted to Donald Trump's defeat in 2020 by attempting to burn down a black church in Springfield, Mass., the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Presbyterian Church that sits adjacent to the community center where I teach US history to adults enrolled in the Clemente course for the humanities. Certainly then, there are men like Matthew Strong, the character in my novel, in every state in the US, white supremacists respect no borders, no boundaries, sacred or secular. When I first started working on the Confessions of Matthew Strong, it occurred to me that what, was, what drove my desire to write about this is, has to do with fear. Um, you know, I was a person who uh, was raised outside New York City, born in the city and raised in upstate New York. Um, but you know, during the 70s and 80s was another time where there was a resurgence of white supremacist actions in upstate New York, which as a kid uh, was a major sort of part of my fear around uh, this phenomenon. Um, I also went to spend my first years as an undergraduate at Greensboro, North Carolina, at Guilford College. I don't know if people know Guilford College, a small school in North Carolina, um, you know, 10 years after the Greensboro Massacre, where Ku Klux Klan and others shot uh, and killed you know, those who were protesting there. And so I realized that this sort of desire to confront this fear um, would be the backbone of, of my story. Um, I also realized that as interested as I am, hey there, as interested as I am uh, in, and I have been understanding and studying and, and, uh, and, and actually teaching as well about sort of racist violence and, and African-Americans' response to that, uh, most people wouldn't be that interested in just reading about that. Right? And so quickly, almost instantaneously, I began to imagine Allie Douglas, who would be my heroine in my story, uh, black, philosopher who teaches at the University in the North, 
who would end up finding herself caught in the crosshairs of uh, this character I created called Matthew Strong. Now, people often ask, hey, you know, Usman, you know, you're, you wrote this novel, you're, you study history, you know, um, you know, is, you know, are the things in here real? And, and this is what I always say to people, right? And this gets at the creative imagination of historians, right? I sought intentionally to write a novel that imagined the events as opposed to writing something that actually imitated actual events that happened, right? And there's a few different reasons why. The first reason is that I didn't want to sort of, you know, you know, God forbid the, the book becomes very successful, allow it to be another creative work that actually inspires certain sorts of behaviors that's based on actual things. Um, that's the first piece. The second piece has to do with my own relationship with historic fiction, as well as uh, sort of films. Like, I don't know if people are aware of the movie Till is about to come out, but you know, films that actually deal with historic content. Um, and as a historian, sometimes I struggle with films that, because we are doing that thing where we're trying to figure out like, wait, I don't think that happened, right? And so I decided to, that I'd be more interested in recreating and reimagining something as opposed to uh, putting either group of people through that. Um, and so this is what led to, uh, to the completion of, of this novel, which, as I mentioned, I've been working on on and off uh, for 15 years. Um, I thought I would read a bit from it. it, it it's, it's always a little awkward for me to read from a novel because the character is a female heroine. And so uh, I joke with my students and say, I'm asking some of you. And actually, I've had a student actually do some reading, or a former student uh, who works at Clark now do some reading for me. But uh, the success of this novel for all of you will be when you stop seeing me and you see Allie Douglas. Yeah? Right? That's the... How quickly that happens is the success of all artistic things. Um, unfortunately, I'm actually reading it, so that may be more difficult with this experience right here. All right. Present day. My name is Allegra Douglas. I am one of the survivors. My story may make you angry, not necessarily at me, but about the reasons things happened the way they did. Only looking back can I put the pieces together in a coherent manner, or at least in a way that makes any sense at all. Many newspapers, publishers, and magazines beg me to tell this story, but I have no desire for the media to frame my story as one of progress from the days Klan Night Riders paraded openly down 16th Street in Birmingham. I refuse to let them profit from the kidnap and torture of black girls. I wouldn't tell them what Matthew Strong confessed to me when I was trapped in the, that plantation home and forced to write his white supremacist mission to redeem the South. I refuse to make him more well known than men like Charles Manson so publishers could make a fortune and he would go down in history as some modern day Nathan Barrett for Forrest. At least that's what I told everyone who asked. But what is the truth? The truth is I feared having my name forever associated with Matthew Strong. And I feared after people read my story, they would sympathize with his mission, even if they deplored his methods. And this is exactly what he wanted. There are those who never believed I remained steadfast in my determination to withhold my story from the public. Some assumed when I finally accepted what had happened, I'd be ready to speak. Others shadowed my posts online, waiting like dogs for me to toss a bone, trying to anticipate when I would break my silence. One thing is for certain though, all the talk in the world won't change anything. So why have I decided to tell you this now? Maybe it's because of something my grandmother used to say. Let your faith be greater than your fear. Of course, she meant this from a Christian perspective, an entire system of beliefs I had abandoned when I entered college. I mean, I may still question the whole, Jesus died for your sins, on the third day he rose again, we resurrected and ascended into heaven thing. But now I find St. Paul's claim that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, to be a guiding principle. Maybe my fear has forced me to have faith that what I say will change the course of events unfolding just how Matthew Strong said they would. 
As a philosopher, I'm drawn to problems. I'm fascinated by the relationship between ideas and actions, ideas behind our motivations, ideas beneath our fears. Some ideas, however, take you down paths best, best left unexplored, ground best left undisturbed. Shortly after I was liberated from the plantation home where Matthew Strong and his men held me and 11 other black women and girls, I remember an FBI agent saying that in nearly every other case, a perpetrator like Strong would kill his hostages rather than allow them to tell their story. And since the FBI rescued me, whenever I hear a Southern accent, memories of my abduction return like mosquitoes at sunset, hovering over my arm, darting through my fingers, daring me to slap so they can slap them so they can laugh and dash, laugh and dash. And that's how my memories come back to me. The first time after I heard a man's voice at my favorite coffee shop. Another time when I came out of my apartment and stumbled into a UPS delivery man. Then I'm there again, feeling my legs go numb, my mind di distorted by whatever they drug me with. I hear a man who said he came to protect me ask if I feel strange. The ends of his words clipped like he was speaking into a fan. I glance at him, and his concerned face melts into a cocky grin. Now he's laughing. They were all laughing, laughing, laughing. Next, I feel them lift me through, an air, through the air like a suitcase before pushing me in the trunk. Keys click, the car engine revs, windshield wipers slap against the glass, rapid beeping, and then I black out. When I woke, I had no idea how long we'd been driving or where we were. Had we left Alabama? Were we in Mississippi? At one point, we stopped and I had to go to the bathroom badly. I tapped the trunk with my knuckles. Silence. I was desperate. I banged harder. Finally, I heard feet crunching over. If you keep begging, we're going to have to give you some more of that medicine. Well, you wouldn't want that now, would you? I have to go to the bathroom. There was a pause. Then I heard a beep and the trunk opened. Two masked men stood over me with a drawn pistol. The other held a machine gun strapped across his back. I had pulled down my blindfold, but they insisted I put it back on before they lifted me out of the trunk. Where are we? They said nothing as they walked me across the gravel to the bushes. Go here. Can I at least take off my blindfold? I heard whispering. Then I felt the barrel of the gun against my back as one untied it. I squinted, my eyes adjusting to the light. I pulled down my pants and squatted. As I peed, I noticed a stretch of pine trees rising up a mountain range, but it was impossible for me to tell if we had driven east to the Appalachian Mountains or south to the Oak Mountains. Think, Allie. One of them jabbed the gun against my back. Keep your eyes on the leaves, you'll be pissing with the blindfold on. He surveyed the woods as if he feared someone would jump out and rescue me. Or was he trying to give me some respect? How ridiculous. For a moment, I considered running, but that would be stupid. I had no idea where I was. They'd shoot me anyway. I pulled up my pants and one took my arm and the other pressed his gun into my back. I pleaded with them as the third blindfold me. Please, I'll pay you. My husband and I have money. One of them laughed. I hated myself for begging, but I begged with all I had. Wait, please, I shouted as they tied my hands behind my back and shoved me back in the trunk. We drove for a while, then stopped. Doors opened and closed. The trunk popped up and the flashlight shined through my blindfold. I felt hands lift me out, then they marched me across a stretch of grass. Tears slipped from beneath my blindfold. I tried to prevent myself from sobbing. They were not tears of sadness or even fear, although of course I was scared. They were tears of frustration. I had allowed myself to be caught off guard. I had let him outsmart me. I heard a door squeak and they escorted me into a room. Uh, and when they sat me in the chair, they untied the blindfold. I glanced up, bl blinking, hazy, and an arm dropped over my shoulder, pulling me close like an old friend. I didn't need to see his face to know who it was. So that's the end of the sort of opening sequence um, and then the, the work. So it takes you back in time to, to the days before actually she's abducted and sort of uh, brings you um, to that. Um, so I thought I, I'd stop there, if that's OK. And um, me and Kevin would will talk a bit about the work. I'm obviously eager to hear what, what he thinks and, and, of course, take your questions uh, about uh, yeah, some of that or some of what I said before. So yeah, shall we? Um, okay. First, thank you for just the generosity of not only reading that opening bit, but also um, sharing and talking about the both 
large scale political, social, historical motivations that animate your investment in this work, but also the, the human scale things. The, um, we live in this sustained place of increased unsettledness. And I think you are pointing precisely to it, and you do it in just with such human grace. I really I, I appreciate that, and also know that that doesn't come without its own toll to the person doing it. So, thank you um, for doing that. Yep. No problem. Yeah. I wonder if if you wouldn't mind saying a little bit for folks who haven't had a chance to read the book. Um, and when the, is the, yeah. the book is like three days to four days from being out, is it out? Yeah. So. According to the publisher, supply side issues, uh, chain issues. So, so what would have been uh, next Tuesday will actually be October twenty fifth. Okay. Um, and so, right. uh, so yeah, it's been pushed okay. back and okay. a bit. So. I just want that date to be out in the world so people yeah. know. October twenty fifth. Uh, October. Now 25th. I used to be saying October eleventh for so long. Right. <laughs> now right. I gotta be like, wait, hold on. Right. So anyway. So maybe we could start by if you if you don't mind say, will you just say a little bit more about the arc of the story, right? Yeah. That. Um, Will you give us a sense of the voice of Allegra Douglas, Ali Douglas, who is telling this story and telling it um, progressively as she counts down the days in a way to being kidnapped in this um, spectacular but uh, utterly believable way, this plot to kind of ignite a, a a civil war. Will you just say a little bit about that story? And then I want to ask you about the, the part that you didn't read that actually opens the book. And yeah, you can yeah. say something about voice that's working there. But do yeah. you mind? Um, so the, the novel, you know, as you, as you sort of read in the open sequence, we have this character who is, is actually confessing to you, you know, sort of about her, sort of her, 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 in some ways, hesitation and reluctance to sort of actually reveal the sorts of ins and outs of it uh, for a variety of ways. And, and so through the, uh, through the story, you sort of come to see, you know, why she's reluctant to really tell it, right? And so um, she ends up uh, going back to, to Alabama. She's in New York. She's teaching university. Her, she's on top of the world. You know, the, this book has won this prizes. And she suddenly realizes uh, she has a circumstance that, that draw her back to, to Alabama, where she, ra where she was raised where she really hadn't spent much time at. Um, and so, you know, once she, she gets down to Alabama, she really, you know, grandmother passed away, um, and she realizes that this, her grandmother and these other mothers had been investigating uh, the disappearance of these black women um, that had been taking place in the area, that the, the police, the FBI, and others didn't see, like, a pattern. They didn't see it as, as coordinated. They just saw it as a, a series of you know, when, when black women go missing, right? And I talk about that also in my author note, um, and sort of how that phenomenon happens. And so, um, you know, suddenly, you know, Allie Douglas is, you know, left, you know, sort of, conf you know, so not confronted negatively, but is confronted at the funeral by one of the mothers, a part of the mother's group. Um, and suddenly Allie finds herself, like, wanting to find out what happened, right? Like, you know, and, and also why her grandmother, who, who raised her, um, you know, didn't really tell her much about it or, you know, because of their sort of fraught relationship. And so suddenly she's back at Alabama <laughs> picking up uh, where her, her grandmother and this, these other mothers had left off. But what she doesn't realize is that um, Matthew Strong has been watching her. He's been watching her in New York. And that he, for a variety of reasons, um, sees her as a very important person for his overall mission. Um, so it's sort of that idea of the sort of unwinding. So early, pretty much the next chapter right away, she's like given a letter, you know, that was sort of like supposed to go to her. And suddenly we see from her vantage point how she gets tricked, right? As you see sort of in that opening passage, and she gets outsmarted, right? And she's a philosopher, right? So she, you know, she makes her living through thinking. Um, and so the novel sort of takes you backwards in time to before she was. She gets kidnapped, uh, and then it takes you uh, to her experience in the plantation home, which are very important sort of theme in this novel is sort of the restoration of plantation homes uh, for this, uh, this insurrection or this revolution. And again, when, my, when we, sadly, I shouldn't be laughing about it, we witnessed such things. My publisher said, like, I can't believe it. You know, this is sort of what was imagined in your work. Uh, I'm not a person who can predict the future, but but... 
you know, I, I can imagine, and I know from studying the history of white supremacist movements and organizations, that these sorts of things have been tried, from Oklahoma City bomber, et cetera, this effort to strike terror and to really ignite people is something that's been important. Um, and so that's, uh, that's where it takes us. And, you know, spoiler alert, she's obviously alive telling the story. So, so it's really not, I'm not just, you know, ruining the ending by saying that indeed, you know, she does live and she makes that of it. And so what is compelling really is just how does it end up happening that she ends up becoming one of the women who, who had been, been abducted. So, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful book in a number of ways, right? That um, you, even the last thing you just said about Allie's survival to tell and the investment the book has in her capacity, her ambivalence about her willingness to tell resonates so much with the discourse of black women's telling of the stories of their own subjection, right? Um, uh, Trisha Rose, the kind of iconic director of the CSREA has longing to tell, but also just the ways in which novelists like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker, a tradition that I think I, I, I recognize you working in, right? Like, giving, finding a way to give complicated, generous voice to a black female protagonist. And I think that you do that well. And so I wonder then if you would say something about this really interesting move that I have ideas about, but I want to ask you about yeah. it first. The book actually starts with Matthew Strong, the titular um, white supremacist white male character mm -hmm. who organizes this sustained institute of violence, abducts the main character. It starts with his voice. Yeah. Uh, will you say something about that? And maybe even, uh, uh, yeah, will you say something about why, why? It's, it's, a, it's a brief beginning. Mm -hmm. How and why did you come to think about that? And, and what's yeah, how does that work for you? So let me just say that, like many choices you make, you go back and forth. Um, I wanted to bring Matthew Strong on the stage sort of immediately because he's, he's such an important character that I thought that waiting, sort of having him be around um, and sort of you know, sends his letters and sort of be there in the presence um, I wanted to bring him on stage right away and sort of give the readers a sense of the creepiness of him, but not too long, you know, just sort of like as a prologue um, to give you a scene that's actually not in the story, right? Because, of course, the story is told through, through first person, it's told through Allie. So she couldn't have been there when one of the women were kidnapped, right? And so I wanted to open, the, so that's really the, the, the move I was doing, is I wanted to open it up as if it was a play. And sort of on, the, on stage, you see this scene that the person you're going to be with through the whole entire journey wouldn't have seen to clue the reader into, um, yeah, to that, to, to what he's sort of, you know, what he's about. And you know, when, when, you know, hopefully people get a chance to read the novel. But when, you know, you, I wanted to give him some voice. I wanted to, to people to understand mm -hmm. that, that he's, he's not a character that I created that you would think of as sort of an indomitable, big, large. He's much more interested in trickery and seduction and, and eeriness about them. And that's, of course, to me, very frightening, right? So he's not coming out, you know, terrifying you. It's much more, you know, bringing you in. And, and so that's, that was also really important for me to develop, you know, from the beginning, a character that may be not what people think of when they think of like the white supremacist, you know, villain and, you know, the sort of person to give them somebody that's like, what's happening in this piece? Like, who, who is this, this voice? And it's kind of weird, you know what I mean? It's a little creepy. Um, and if that was effective and, and people read it like, okay, wow, what was happening a little bit? And, um, that I think in some ways it was effective because I wanted that unsettled feeling. You know, you know, it's you know something that you will have to experience, everybody, because it is a little weird in terms of stylistically. Um, and I, I hope that the people find it effective. I, I think it's incredibly effective, right? It's it's two and a half pages. It's very brief, but it's so richly re rendered. And one of the things that I just as a 
um, you know, I read as a reader. I read, of course, as, as a as a both a fan and and someone who is always in awe of your thinking and the way in which you bring to bear um, a, a kind of astute astute sense of history um, to your work. But I also read as a a, a critic or a writer or just a, a thinker in a generic sense. And one of the things I find incredible about it is it's in his voice. He's talking to one of the young girls that he's abducted, right? Um, uh, Odessa. Mm -hmm. And he's talking to her, but you don't hear her response. And so there's something about that evacuated conversation that amplifies the creepiness um, that, that um, constitutes or, or, or renders in a way that sense of a, the, the seductiveness of an adult in regard to a young person. So it's, it's, it's gentle, but it's also domineering because you hear one voice that's gesturing towards another person who you don't hear back. And I think it's so effective and, and that it's kept so brief, um, brings him on stage and then suspends him appropriately so that you can do other work. Mm -hmm. um, so just from my vantage point, I'm one like, person uh, and not even... You know, and like the second person who read it. So. Just, just, just <laughs> the second one, person I ever talked to who read it. So just thank one you. modest person, but um, <laughs> I, I think it's really effective. And I, I wasn't going to go here next, but since you, you said something about creating this character and wanting, in a way, to to have enough empathy for your characters. And Toni Morrison, amongst um, many novelists, always talks about, right, that you you have to be able to create, create protagonists mm -hmm. for whom you have enough empathy to understand something about how they come into being and their motivations for being in the world. Mm -hmm. You do that, but mm -hmm. the idea of empathy is also important in the novel itself. Yep. Um, and it's important for Allie. And that's connected to her being a philosopher and thinking about truth and so on. So would you say, is that something that you were deliberately thinking about in terms of part of what, um, what organizes Ali's being a black woman in the world and a black philosopher yep. in, in the academy? Is that she's trying to hold on to truth mm -hmm. over and against the fact that the idea of truth never is imagined to be something that she would be interested in or be capable of, or the, the capacities of truth never seem to work um, towards her benefit. Is that, is that a thing you see working out in the novel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, it's the central sort of, you know, thematic element um, is around, you know, it's not something that we all sort of don't rest, wrestle with is interpretation of what is true, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, much of the reason why people, you know, many people are, are seduced by sort of white power ideology um, is because there's a version of the truth that people really believe. Mm -hmm. They really believe it. And you can tell them and try to find facts you want, but, you know, they have so much invested in a certain understanding of the United States, of their positionality, that rational reasoning, you know, sometimes is not enough. Um, and so, as a professional philosopher, you know, my, you know, Ali Douglas is, um, you know, very much a person that spends her time trying to explain, understand complicated truths in thinking and, you know, and sort of understanding. She studies white supremacist ideology and slaveholder ideology. So that's her sort of area. And that's part of why she gets sucked in. Um, and so my efforts to be effective at making Matthew Strong creepy in fiction, this is my view, unlike, say, film, right? We have so many other vehicles to make a character be afraid requires a, what I think to be a depth of character, right? So, you know, the character, it's not just believable or whatever, that's so vague. It's that people have to really say like, wow, this person is an actual person that, and that makes you afraid. You see what I'm saying? Um, and so that process, artistic process for me, uh, and, and there's at least one person in the room who read early versions of this, 
you know, it was very different where he, where Matthew Strong actually did have more voice, right? So in earlier versions, I wrote out a lot of his dialogue and a lot of what he's saying and speaking to the audience and talking about his ideas. So, you know, that's not what ends up in the book, but all those pages and pages of me really writing, like, you know, sort of putting on that hat, studying and listening to the ideas of, you know, actual uh, white supremacists and then trying to, T him to tell us his story, I think is what the residue is of, um, that still allows him to have more multidimensionality. I mean, there will be people and already have who will say, oh, well, you know, he's too one dimensional. And, 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 you know, now that I'm a, a novelist, I'm not allowed to talk back. They say the artist can't speak back. Oh, you, you, you have to just say, okay, well, you know, that's your interpretation. But my response to that is that this is the limitation of first person voice. This is a, you know, you make that choice, you know, sort of, you go with it, and one of the limitations is the character doesn't really know the other characters like if you, like how I, how I did before, where, you know, there were pages in there where Matthew Strong was the character, it was through his perspective. So the reader, the benefit of that is the reader was able to get a much more nuanced understanding of everything that was happening. When I sacrificed that, that was ultimately, um, you know, I had to hope that sort of passages and, you know, and the letters would supply enough of, uh, of, of Matthew Strong to give people that sense of who he is without all those pages of him sort of actually being written to where you have him on, you know, through his voice. So, And might I offer another way in which I actually see the idea of empathy also working, right? Mm -hmm. Because one of, you're right, that one of the places one would go, and I think many people will immediately go, is to try to think about empathy vis-a-vis -vis Matthew Strong. Um, but I, I'm also thinking about your uh, protagonist, Ali's struggle with empathy herself, meaning both her own, her own relationship to the history, she, the philosophy she studies mm -hmm. is about saying, well, I'm interested in thinking about their thinking. I'm not interested only in like denigrating them, right? Like I'm trying to figure out how to think with their thinking. And that's for her a complicated process. And I think you do a really good job of showing that. But there's also a moment um, in the novel where Reverend Carey is reminding or telling Allie, not reminding her because she doesn't know this, how um, there's a group of the um, the mothers group. Yeah, it's, like, no, it's just the mothers group. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like a, it's like a civic black women's club yeah. organization. Yeah. I want to ask you about that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. But there's a mothers group. And so it's these black women, older black women who are investigating disappeared um, black girls and black women. And... Um, Reverend Carey reminds, tells Allie, well, you know, your grandmother had organized a meeting between black women and white women in the community where black women could tell white women about all the horrible things that their husbands had done historically for many years to black women. And there, there's this moment of, if not reconciliation, mm -hmm. reckoning and perhaps towards recognition. And I'm using those three terms, reconciliation, reckoning, and recognition in the tradition that I think you inspire, which is a tradition to think about philosophy, you're quoting philosophers in here, and theology, mm -hmm. right? The, the move towards, well, what is it that we owe to each other? Mm -hmm. And I think that that moment in the book, when you all get the book, it's around page 207, <laughs> is, a, is a striking moment, because it's not resolved, and Ali's kind of like, I don't know, wait, what? and black women are listening to white women, and white women are listening to black women tell this, and what's this supposed to do? But it's about, it's your novels grappling with, through Ali, empathy. It's your novel trying to do a thing that we don't do at all very well in the world, which is to try to think well, how do we be with each other given these histories of violence? So that's another, when you, yeah. when you get that question on the tour about empathy and so on, <laughs> another way you could, right? Because I think that's also Helpful. there in the novel that I, that I see you as a, and maybe that's just part of something you are also invested in as a human being. It, 100, I mean, you know, when you spend as much time as I do thinking about black political movements, thinking about black political thought, 
thinking about struggles, really horrible sort of things that have happened. People always ask me, like, you know, how do you spend, you know, so much time in this sort of darkness? And, and you know, part of it, it is an intellectual thing. That's the way I escape, right? It's sort of intellectualizing things. And, um, but there are moments where what we realize, what at least what I realize, speak for myself, um, either my intellectual practice, my sort of like teaching and community practice, or through my creative practice, when what's more interesting to me is that idea of how to find empathy when terrible things have happened, right? Like, how does one find a balance when they're very upset or they're horrified? Or And I'm, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> like, I don't know how one does that. But every time I see it, I'm fascinated by it. Um, and I'm fascinated. And that's one of the reasons why it's Allie who is being sort of, you know, politely mother like a southern black woman mother league my mom's a southern black woman um you know kind of pulls her up on it like you know this is you know you know it's not sympathy it's empathy it's different she tells ali you know it's like you know like you know it sort of you know corrects her around what was happening and you know i have been corrected many times uh and so that was something that was very important to me was sort of um making sure that my readers you know and they do get, you know, an inside look in terms of the black community. You, know, you really are seeing the unveiling of uh, these sort of black women and, and how they're thinking about these events and how they're thinking about um, themselves and keeping going and and how they, as as you know, black people and particularly um, you know black women in the South have kept keep doing, have done, continue to do in the face of horror, right? So what we really get is a story where mixed into it, and, and obviously in my rendering, central to it is that I, truth is there, but more importantly, I, I agree, is empathy. And I'm, I'm glad that you, <laughs> that you called it out and you sort of noticed it um, because it is something that I'm grappling with. I think it's really important to conversations and dialogue and studying um, as opposed to sympathy, right? Which, you know, of course, um, is something very different. And I would even say the, the, the practice of truth, right? That is the coming into a relationship with what you think you know, how you think you know it, and how that causes you to act. And again, another part of what I find so compelling about the richness of Ali as a character is that you take us on a journey with her as she is in that process of coming to a closer relationship to what she thinks she knows how she thinks she knows it, and how she wants to act vis-a-vis -vis it, rather than the self-right, what would be a self-righteous flatness of character, who would indeed be entitled to be self-righteous because of the things she's fighting. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that's, an, um, that's just another part of what's successful about your uh, uh, materializing a character that has that kind of full flesh, full, full worlded um, meaningfulness. Um, it's a detective novel too. Mm -hmm. You're a historian. Yep. And, um, and, and, and uh, maybe a, a philosopher on the side. <laughs> and you might, even have a, you, you might even have a little bit of the theologian in you, but you also, you're also clearly a novelist. And, uh, and, and so I want to ask you a two-part question. One, will you say something about just your own relationship to thinking about the detective elements of this novel, how unusual it is to have a novel that is in part a detective novel be have a black woman as its protagonist and have you know a, a, a cohort of older black women what we would think of as grandmothers as a detective group to some extent so if you would say something about that and then i also just want to ask you um because the two questions are connected to thinking mm -hmm. about um narrative tradition literary yeah. tradition um uh i think i can recognize many, many literary dimensions to this work, work moments where you're signaling or signifying to words or citing or engaging with um, iconic moments in the African-American literary tradition, particularly Black women's literary tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, too, if you might say something about some of your yeah. inspirations and, um, yeah. 
Yeah, so the the first part is has to do with the you know what um and I'm blanking the scholar Dan probably remembers that that this book The Long Shadow Richard Wright. Um who's this guy? I forgot the scholar's name who wrote this. What's his name? How did she I don't know if she she may have. I'm not sure if she did. But you know, Richard Wright was one of the first sort of, you know, my father was like, oh, you got to read Richard Wright. You got to. And I was like a teenager. I was like, you know, ah, you know, I'm not. But I found myself attracted to the idea of puzzles, right? So the idea of the puzzle, the, the thing to figure out. And maybe that's, again, what attracted me to being a historian because it's sort of like the never ending puzzle. And then you have to send the book out eventually. because <laughs> It's like, all right, you may not know the answer to that question. Um, and so I'm very attracted to, to ideas of, of puzzles, sort of things that, that I'm not sure about and don't understand. And so despite the fact that I wouldn't say I'm a person that like loves detective fiction so much, but I am very intrigued by, you know, sort of the mysteries surrounding the unknown. Um, and I found myself attracted to them in film and also um, in literature. And so when... I decided to frame this was this was supposed to be my artsy novel, by the way, y'all. Uh, I actually, you know, and again, my friends read those versions, which is really ironic. But because I decided to make a change, I decided um, the, the, the this is this is actually four different novels. Um, there was the first novel, which I sort of shared around draft twelve, and there was draft twenty, um, then thirty, and then forever like seven years like this um and so rewriting it i began to realize that as i reconfigured the work as artistic work that one thing that was very interesting had always been this sort of what's happened with these women and that was there um and so when i made that change i started lean i started just leaned into it and so I did a draft, and I started beginning to to bring the detectives to life, um, the FBI agents. Whereas before it was like, see, you know, there were like letters and you know, sort of pieces of evidence, things of that nature. Um, and and I just leaned into it, and I thought to myself, and this is part of it too. And you know, I already write enough works that like a lot of my friends will never read, <laughs> and and not only will they never read it, but even if they did read it, they probably would not enjoy it. Um, and so I decided that, you know what, um, this sort of, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a craft choice, right? This is a craft choice that I made, you know, after having worked through it so long, was also an invitation to bring more people in. Um, and so the choice to, to use that convention, sort of detective convention, was really, a, a, you know, was, was a gesture to bring people in because... While Professor Kwashi and I am a student of Professor Kwashi, everybody, you know, I, I sat in, in this man's classes as a graduate student, and he can tell me the literary references, which I, by the way, I'm very excited about. Um, you the, the the creative geography of the work. He understands that. There hasn't been one reader yet in terms of my editors who have any sense of any of that, right? They've been compelled by the story. Um, and... Um, and so it, in that sense, it's been successful in that sense, right? Because I, I intentionally shifted it to a work that would be compelling and would, quote, unquote, move. You know, I, um, I joke with my colleagues at Clark, you know, because I've asked them also, like, <laughs> Professor Kwashi, you know, we're, we're professional readers. So we always have manuscripts or reviews. And I, keep, I said to them, it's an easy read. And I say that compared to the types of works that they usually work with. I wanted it, I decided that I wanted it to be an easy read. I wanted them to be able to engage it and there to be enough intellectually and sort of creatively to be stimulating and interesting, but at the same time, um, you know, be, be an easy read. And so that's also why when I changed it, I just used the conventions of, uh, of crime fiction, which the thing is with genres, one more thing quickly about genres, I actually don't fully understand all the genres. <laughs> like, you know, we know a, a thriller. Is it a thriller? I'm like, I think so. You know, is it is it is it a mystery? Uh, yeah. You know, is it is it a crime fiction? Like, so I actually, when I see it, it, it listed as like a, a historical fiction, I'm like, oh yeah, there's history in it. I don't necessarily. I'm not sure about that because usually historical fictions like about an actual, you know, Cromwell <laughs> or, or Martin Luther King. Like, it's about a historic figure, whereas my characters aren't real, right? So, so for me, I'm like, okay, like, 
you know, it, it deals with history. Um, you know, so I do have some of these, you know, this tour I'm going on, sort of them saying like, oh, crime fiction, right? The one I'm doing in Brooklyn. So I'm fascinated, almost wanted to ask the people, like, how'd you choose crime fiction versus mystery versus thriller versus historical fiction? Like, what, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's obvious. So I wouldn't ask that question because it has those elements. Um, but, um, but hopefully it's just some people enjoy, you know what I mean, at the end of the day. And is stimulating in that sense. So, um, so yeah. Maybe I'll um, I'll ask one more question, and then if if we if people want to ask questions, we can do that. Um, and I'll ask the question partly by um, advancing the last thing you said. You said this thing about artsy. You this this was supposed to be, but I guess by implication, it's not your artsy novel. And you said this thing about an easy read. And um, I'm not one to disagree with you because it's your book. Uh, but maybe to push it, I'll lean on Toni Morrison because you can't disagree with Toni <laughs> Morrison. You can disagree with me, but you can't disagree with um, Ms. Morrison. May she rest in peace. Um, part of the success of your telling makes the story, yes, one that someone could go along with. And I also think there are ways in which you have these signposts, either the the epigraphs that open up the chapters, which are either references to um, take lines from the Bible, take lines from Sojourner Truth, or from Harriet Jacobs, right? That there are these signposts that are also asking the reader to do some work, to understand that they are with a character who's also doing some work, it's true. To also understand that they are in a fictionalized world that is related to the world we live in, which is always asking all of us mm -hmm. to do some work. Yeah. And so I think as I read the work and I think about the moment where um, Ali is thrown into a closet, mm -hmm. you've referenced Jacobs. I can't help but think Harriet Jacobs describing herself in the garret, right, in the loophole of the retreat. Um, I can't help but think about the Black Women's Club movement and, and the, the, the mother's group. Um, you reference and take us back to, in your author's note, the Kumbahi River uh, Collective, which comes about because a number of Black women had gone missing in Boston and no one was responding to it. So that there is a part of the success of your writing is that you are not only speaking with a tradition of black of black literature and black women's literature in particular but you're also telling a story mm -hmm. in the long tradition of from the narratives of enslaved peoples right up to uh, any contemporary fiction where the art of storytelling especially for african americans is the lure of being pulled into the voice such that you are then invited into a world of doing a certain kind of work. Yep. And I think I, 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 that would be my way of, of, of yep. characterizing it rather than acquiescing to the kind of genres, as you're saying, right? Where yep. you're like, well, I guess it is that. It's the, it's, it's the genre of black storytelling and yep. black storytelling has that kind of density um, as it also has in it a relationality or the capacity to be invited into the thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I will. I I, I do I do agree with you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. No, you're absolutely. Right. I mean, so the 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 iconic works. Um, if we know these, you know, Tony K. Bambara's "These Bones Are Not My Child," um, that Tony Morrison edited, sort of finally got out and. Those that know Toni K. Bambara and know how sort of iconic and crucial she is to understanding American literature and African American literature as well, um, the challenge for her to finish that novel because she really wanted to do right by the mothers and the families that endured the the Atlanta you know, the killings in Atlanta um, is the tradition you're absolutely referencing that, that as I said many people will not be aware of novels such as that. Um, and then, of course, you know, Ty, Ty Jones is leaving Atlanta. And, and so 
very specifically, these are my, you know, my my mentors and my gods. You know, these tremendous black women writers, others, you know, Toni Morrison, of course, and um, have guided me through trying to think through the entire story from day one. Um, Angela Davis is clearly, you know, the the major influence on my character. Um, you know, I, I I didn't create it. You know, it's like she is the major influence on it. Uh, I didn't want to do like a biopic or anything like that. So she's not, it's not Angela Davis, but um, those that are familiar with black female intellectuals and in tradition can't help but think about the iconic black women intellectuals and writers. And I include Harriet Jacobs in that group. You know, the ability to capture, to, to walk lines, to suggest um, and to be, both a writer and engaged in a movement, right, which she was, uh, are crucial to to every single decision I made in the work, and that's where the you know sort of the epigraphs, the beginnings, the quotes come from. Um, it's 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 alley, you know, it's sort of like a, a curriculum, you know, in a way, for one to think about uh, engagement with Black intellectual tradition, you know, be it ball and evidence of of evidence of things unseen, which is, you know, people never talk about that work. I read that with horror when I, I mean, I, you know, I, I wrote a, I was asked to write um, a piece uh, for, it was like the crime blog actually, on the Lit Hub, um, which is totally fine. Like, I, you know, I, I was honored to, to write this piece. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking through when I was writing this essay was I was thinking about my me finding that book on my father's bookshelf when I was in college, actually, right? So this is an essay, you know, again, Baldwin, like many others, wrote about the Atlanta child murders, and this is his, like, sort of extended essay about that. You almost never hear anyone reference it, um, and, you know, maybe people think, I don't know, I, actually, I don't even know what people think, because it's just so rarely discussed. Um, but for me, as a college student, um, and as a person who was horrified as a kid, like, that was the... The, the driving force partly behind this the entire novel. Um, when I read that, it was it was really terrifying. Like I was like, wow, like Baldwin's a genius in the sense of following the mother. He's doing sort of an investigative journalist piece almost, an essay, you know, what, what, what he does. I found it to be so compelling as like a 20 year old, you know, sort of stumbling upon that, you know, my on my dad's bookshelf. Um, these are, as you mentioned, as you as you clearly saw, uh, have been essential to how I've been thinking about this, both artistically and as an intellectual, and also tapping into the artists and intellectuals who have done it in ways that have moved me. Um, and so, um, yes, that's, is that, yeah. is, that, is that what you were getting at? That, yeah. No, that and more, right? That I think even in your responding to it, you're just opening up other ways of thinking about it. Um, uh, I, the invisible, the, in this book, letters and documents are so important as a part of the detective story. And that too evokes back to not just the literature of slavery, but something like Invisible Man, where the meditation on letters and docu official documents become a part of what's being negotiated. But I'll just, I'll, I'll say that um, as you reference Baldwin's um, Evidence of Things Not Seen, in the preface of that book, um, Baldwin talks about being a witness. And um, it's one of the places, though the idea of witnessing gets connected to Baldwin a lot, it's one of the places where he explicitly is trying to think about, like, what does it mean to try to be a witness? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I might say back to you as, as, mm -hmm. as a friend, as a, as, a, as a scholar, someone who is, admires you as a human being, as someone who feels grateful to have known you, is that what you've offered in this book is a is a kind of witnessing, mm -hmm. um, a kind of uh, thinking about and staying with the the long difficulty and trying to hold that up in a way that um, yeah that would invite a reader into the responsibility for for holding the thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really, really an accomplishment. So thank you for talking to me um, and for being in the world and for making this book. Um, and most of all, thank you. Thank you for the work. Thank you for sharing time with us. And uh, yeah, we're all looking forward to more and more success with this book. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming, all of you, those watching.